This is Binod Shankar and you're listening to the Real Finance Mentor podcast from the realfinancementor.com. The Real Finance Mentor is your go-to resource for insight and inspiration on careers in finance, CFA and more. Now you think why this podcast? Well, my goal is to deliver insight and inspiration for your finance career by making it one relatable. This is not theoretical stuff. We zero in on the critical practical issues. Number 2, authentic. No bullshit, no side stepping. The topics, guests and questions are all from that perspective. And number 3, take a charge the ground and see if a chart holder at 17 plus years as a corporate warrior, mixing 10 years of entrepreneurship, doing a decade of full-time CFA training, at speaking, mentoring, cycling and mountaineering, and that's me. Welcome to the Real Finance Mentor, or as I call it, RFM. Hi everyone, this is Binod Shankar here with the Real Finance Mentor podcast. the podcast that brings you insight and inspiration for your careers uh today i have another guest who will throw light on many of the questions that most people have regarding careers and leadership my next guest is deepak mehra so first of all his resume uh deepak is head of investments at the commercial bank of dubai and he is based in dubai the bank is listed on the dubai financial market and is one of the leading banks in the united arab emirates Deepak started his career at City Bank, where he joined as manager of its mortgage business in Delhi and Bangalore. He then moved to City in uh, Dubai many years ago, when he was the Middle East head for his investments and uh, bank insurance business, targeting mainly non-resident Indians. After short stints at uh, Dubai Bank, Credit Suisse, and Dubai First, he joined um, his current employer, Commercial Bank of Dubai. He has been there for the last uh, 15 years. Dubai uh, Deepak comes with some uh, impeccable credentials he's a graduate of the Indian Institute of Technology Banaras Hindi University Varanasi and has an MBA from the prestigious Institute of Management Technology IMT in Ghaziabad uh, Deepak Deepak is also an author a published author no less in 2015 Deepak's book uh, Ready Steady Go was published by Jaco Publishing House a leading uh, publishing house in India Deepak is also a regular guest on Bloomberg, where he opines on uh, financial matters. And of course, as all of you know, I have uh, very special people on the show. Now, the reason I invite Deepak is not just because he's a banker. I know a lot of bankers, but it's because I've known him for close to a decade, if if my memory serves me right. And we have had many deep, long, intellectual discussions about the human condition, specifically careers and leadership. i have found him to be uh, to possess not uh, just a remarkable amount of self awareness and a big picture perspective but also willingness to articulate this quite boldly and compellingly which uh, as you can imagine are not common attributes of people in higher levels of management uh, deepak this is going to be what another one of our chats <laughs> with the big difference that many others will get the privilege to hear your words of wisdom uh, thank you for agreeing to this interview thank you so much vinod and you know how much i respect you and your wisdom about these matters about life in general and i think we we've, we've had so many conversations around these subjects it will be one more of those i'm really looking forward to it thank you so much so let's jump into the questions which i have a lot uh, prepared uh, to ask you the book first is i'm sure you have mentored many professionals over your long career what do you look for before you mentor anyone yeah you know that is a that's a very you know that's not an easy one to get get it right because what i see around myself as people who are not very much very much aware about themselves or who do not really have a plan about the future so what i do look in people is somebody who has given it a bit of a thought who who has thought about where he is heading who who probably has some idea of his own skills and abilities and how he can reach there so i tend to look for people who have at least the beginning of self awareness because without that you can't get anywhere so i tend to follow the the usual coaching model of the you know which is called the grow model mm. the g r o w which is what are your goals uh, what is your reality uh, 
And then what are the options in front of you and how will you move uh, into the way ahead? So mm. that's, uh, that's, that's how I look at people. And so people who have defined their goals is actually, you know, and I know that's about 50% of the battle won. Because how many people actually sit down and write their goals? Mm. We all say that goals are very important, but how many of us actually do that? So somebody who's done it or somebody who can articulate his goals is 50% there. And then, of course, we can work with him to find out his realities, his, his levels of skills. And that, again, requires some level of awareness. You know, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? And therefore, based on my strengths and weaknesses, what are the options I have in front of me? And then what are the options that I will choose? So that is a process that I can help them with. And mm. that mentoring for me is, uh, you know, that, that's how I look at people. So it's, it's difficult. It, it, it's not everyone can't go through a mentoring process. Everyone cannot be a good a mentee. Uh, I think that also requires a bit of skills. Mm. Sticking to the same uh, topic of mentoring, Deepak, uh, we are both at the stage and age of life and career where we have been mentored ourselves over the past few decades uh, by, by many people. So who has been your mentor and or mentors and, and what impact did that mentoring have on you uh, on a professional and personal front probably as well? Yeah, I, I think professionally I have, I have uh, observed a lot of people and got mentored. I've never had a single mentor who I have, you know, worked with or somebody. So I've not had the pleasure of that. But I like to get, uh, and I like to pick up qualities from different people I meet uh, and pick up whatever best I can from them. What are the things that I can do? Or what are the things I can avoid? So observing people is probably the biggest mentorship I get all around me. Uh, the good and the bad, uh, what to do and what to avoid. But yeah, talking about mentors in specific, I think from the childhood, uh, I have been mentored with, by my father. I think the most important thing he did was put me on the path of excellence, on the path of hard work, on the path of you know drive and hunger for achievement. So I remember very vividly, I was in class six and I was a very average student. I was a sort of a student who used to be scared of taking the report card home because I would always get the 60, 61, 65% marks. And my father was, was, a, was a gold medalist throughout his life in his engineering postgraduate and so on. So he didn't like where his son was heading. So one mm -hmm. day I remember he told me, he said, we were sitting outside in our garden and he showed me a, a rickshaw puller going outside on the street. And he says, do you see this guy who was pulling the rickshaw? Do you know? how hard he works. I said, yeah, he works very hard throughout the day. He's having three, four people sit behind and he has to then mm. manually drive that rickshaw around. So he said, my son, this is the only money that we've got for you. Uh, we can buy you a, a good rickshaw, not the old one, you'll buy a new one. But this is what you will do if you continue the way you are in your academics. This is the best we can do for you, buy you a rickshaw. That, you know, gave me nightmares after that. Mm. Uh, and, and, you know, we used to go around in rickshaws in those days. And, and you can see the, the plight of the rickshaw puller. And I imagined myself doing that. And I think that is when the turning point came. And I never looked back after that. I was, I was straight on, uh, you know, top ranking in every class after that. Probably suddenly something happened. Mm. Um, so I thank my father for that. And, and then, of course, my... I got an opportunity to stay with my grandfather because my father was sent overseas on deputation. So three years or so, I stayed with my grandfather. He was a very spiritual man, luckily not religious or ritualistic. He was a doctor, medical doctor. He told me some things which made sense much later in life, but the, the seeds were sown then. And he said, look, we are all connected. We are one consciousness, you, me, and everyone around, the living, the non-living beings, we are all one. Because he, he was a man of science. That gave me a perspective of much bigger things, that we are part of something much bigger in life. Uh, that probably brings the perspective that I get every time I see a problem. Um, and he said, look, we are the ocean. Uh, we are not the droplets of the ocean that emerge from it and go back to it. Uh, people talk about the soul and 
and and and consciousness and consciousness and so he says you are the ocean you are not the droplet mm-hmm. so that was a very revealing thing which i understood partly then but partly much later and i think these are the sort of things that have formed me um, binod over the years other than reading books and uh, you know introspection and i think i am myself the best mentor i can get uh, when i am when i'm introspecting when i'm absorbing when i'm learning from everyone around me i mean i'm fascinated by how people change over long periods of time deepak and i have certainly changed uh, people have remarked how much i have changed that's how i know i won't mention the changes because many of the uh, of the cringe worthy acts of omission and commission <laughs> which will become public knowledge i know you think deeply and honestly about both yourself and others if you look back 30 years can you tell me three key ways in which you evolved in 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 basically two separate areas one is in the way you manage yourself uh, i think something that i touched upon and probably we'll talk more about it during the the, the discussion today is the biggest change i've felt from the time i started working to now is when i finally realized uh the importance of self awareness and i think the turning point about self awareness came when i or the clarity came uh when i read eckhart tolle's uh, book uh, the power of now and uh, uh, a new earth so both these books mm. uh a, a, and that changed my life that led to me becoming a sort of an observer of my own self uh, rather than just playing a role um Uh, you know and getting caught up in what's happening in our life i could then take a step back and observe myself as somebody on the theater playing a role mm-hmm. and then observe myself dispassionately uh, in a detached manner and as you start observing yourself you start then uh, and it's very important to be dispassionate you don't have to really be harsh on yourself because we keep doing acts of omission and commission that like you rightly said which which are cringe worthy but then if you're observing yourself from a distance uh, eventually eventually that detachment happens and you can actually start directing yourself or if not directing yourself at least you can start introspecting uh, and and learning from that so i think that self awareness bit is a is a very big exercise and you know it's a simple thought experiment i can do it right now if i tell you bino think about uh, a sweet mango and and think about how juicy it is in your mouth right now mm. and you think about it and then now i tell you you know look back and did you think about a mango you'll say yes i thought about a mango so that that means you're not the thinker you know because you just looked at yourself a while ago thinking about a mango that means you are not the thinker that means you can observe yourself Mm. that means you don't have to get caught up in the in the the day to day flurry of action around you you can detach so i think that is that is one of the biggest learnings that came uh, in my life and the second one is is something i touched upon earlier also is developing the big picture the big uh, you know purpose of life uh, what am i doing is it mm. just you know was i born to study hard get a good you know get into a good college get a good job slog uh, you know fight the the politics in the company and and then earn money and then pay my bills uh, that's about it no i think there is a bigger meaning to life and and the bigger meaning to life has to be explored and we need to work towards it and therefore mm-hmm. that gives you the big picture perspective that that makes you calm eventually it's like the story uh, i don't know you may have heard the story of the the stone stone cutter you know so a man walks into a a village and he finds a very large construction site uh, and he finds people sitting there breaking stones uh, and he goes to the first one says what are you doing here uh, what are you guys doing so he says don't you see i'm cutting stones uh, don't disturb me he goes ahead and finds another stone cutter saying what are you guys doing he says come on don't disturb me you know just get going we are cutting stones don't you have eyes can't you see and he moves a little further on he sees 
another stone cutter who was singing and humming and breaking stones he says what are you doing here he says oh look at what we are doing we are going to be building the biggest fruit and vegetable market in the village and this is where all the vegetables and fruits will be coming to be to be sold i am working to build that and you know what when this market is ready we my family and all other farmers will be able to sell our vegetables at better prices faster vegetables will not be destroyed we'll have more employment we'll have more money mm. and that's why i'm so happy and i'm singing and humming and now he's doing the same job as every other stone stone cutter but he was calm and happy because he saw the bigger picture so i think these are the sort of revelations that when they happen in your life mm. your perspective changes and you can ride a much higher at a much higher uh, level uh, rather than get, getting caught in the frenzy mm. so these are sort of ways that i have changed myself radically and and i was quite an ordinary uh, job bloke but with a lot of practice and 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 reading and understanding and introspection these changes have come about yeah so there were two questions i think the first question you answered me mm. but which was how what are three ways in which you evolved in the way you managed mm. yourself my second question was again what are the three ways in which you evolved in the way you manage others yes yes and i think that is another very interesting one because we've been theoretically and in our education have been brought up uh saying that yeah managing others means getting things done mm. uh, very task oriented very one way oriented communication and so on i think the, the way i learned sorry the, the the things that i learned is one you do not have to manage anyone you you have to engage with people people are smart enough to do and manage their jobs uh, your job as a manager is to engage with them now what does engagement mean engagement means a two way communication not a one way communication mm-hmm. engagement means uh, a connection of the heart uh, not just of the head not just mechanical directions and mechanical conversations but more of a connection where you actually get to know people better different people have different uh, uh, you know goals different aspirations uh, different people have you 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 stroke different people with you know different folks uh different strokes for different folks uh, sorry so understanding that everyone is unique everyone is a human being everyone has a family a personal life uh his his or her own challenges his or her own life behind ensuring and not just saying uh, you know for the sake of words but ensuring that they actually lead a balanced life mm. helping them grow uh pushing them when required uh mentoring them even if they don't ask to be mentored uh you know these are the connections of the heart this is mm-hmm. how how you would uh, manage somebody who's who's your child or who's somebody in your house who's younger than you how would you conduct with them i'm not saying you become sympathetic and you become soft no no way but have an empathy you know uh, these are people you spend 8 hours 10 hours in a day so you can't just have a mechanical relationship a lot of people mistake what engagement is they think you know cracking a few jokes or taking mm. them out for drinks or going out for lunch and, and and meeting over the weekends or sharing jokes is engagement none, none of these are engagement these are very transactionary uh, processes which are very superfluous and you can know that this is the person has nothing better to engage with and hence he's doing these uh, uh, again mechanical acts mm. none of this is required engagement is a matter of heart so i think changing the way we deal with people um, using your heart engaging developing people mentoring them and helping them achieve their uh, full potential uh, i think is 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 the is the way i changed uh, over the years you know i mean going from individual contributor to team leader to manager to leader is a big journey is a long journey a lot of people don't make it uh, you're obviously a leader uh, uh, where you are right now and and you have been for some time now there are many means by which you can become an effective leader right i mean you can learn by observing your bosses by a feedback from colleagues and superiors by getting a mentor or a coach by reading relevant books or listening to podcasts i mean there are so many ways 
Some of these have worked for me, especially feedback and reading, but it's quite individual and quite subjective, right? So I'm just curious, what are the three top methods by which you developed your own leadership skills and why those methods worked for you? So I think it is very clear that uh, I did not have one single mentor and I keep taking inputs from everywhere. Uh, mm. Podcasts, YouTube videos, uh, books. Um, you know, It was books only now, uh, earlier. Uh, podcasts have made life much easier. Mm. I can listen to them while I'm driving, while I'm doing something else, while I'm exercising in my gym and so on. So, so the, the way I take knowledge is through all these methods. Now, my leadership ideas or thoughts, and I think it will be, uh, you know, I wouldn't put it in such a very, such a big context, but yeah, ideas and thoughts that come are coming through these inputs. Uh, so remaining open to inputs is very important, but remaining open to inputs comes when you realize that you need inputs. Mm. So some of us get so lost in their own existence that they don't think that they need any more inputs. And that could be one of the, the stumbling blocks uh, towards leadership development. Uh, so being humble, at least, to understand that you know there is more to learn uh, is the starting point. And then being open to all these inputs that can come through anything, even a conversation like ours today can be an input for somebody. Uh, but that's one part. The second step in this process is then uh, uh, you know, observing yourself, how you behave. I mean, this is, you know, getting in touch with the reality. So I've got inputs, I've got thoughts, but then analyzing myself, introspecting, observing myself, and finally practicing what I've mm. learned. Now, you can't change unless you practice and then observe, practice and observe. Uh, so new inputs, practice and observe. So it's a, it's a cycle. And, and, and we are all learning. I'm, I'm still learning. I, I still think that I'm somewhere in the, in the journey mm. uh, and, and I haven't really covered even probably half of it. There is so much more to learn. Uh, so it's an ongoing exercise, but it begins with the first realization that I have something else to learn. Mm. Uh, mm. And I think that's in a nutshell, the leadership development journey, if you, if you put it in, in, in that way. So Deepak, your LinkedIn profile shows an unbroken career in banking ever since you joined Citibank in you know, 1992 uh, through you know, Credit Suisse, Dubai Bank, and now right now Commercial Bank of Dubai, where you've been for 15 years uh, since 2007, right at the same place. Overall, that is three decades in banking, and you seem to be still going strong. Right? Uh, I know many senior professionals including commercial and private bankers, investment bankers, and quite a few are already bored after spending 15 to 20 years or sometimes even less in the same industry. They feel stagnant, they want to change. So I have a few questions for you here. First question is, why do you think are the three main reasons why so many people get dissatisfied with their careers and lives once they hit their late 30s or early 40s? Yeah, that's a good observation, uh, Bino, that I see the same around me. Um, mm. I think the, the primary reason is that goes back to the first principles, uh, you know, lack of goals, lack of planning, lack of clarity of purpose. Cl clarity of purpose is a very wide term, but yeah, just put it this way, that lack of defined goals and, and uh and how to achieve those goals. And eventually, uh, you know, a lack of prioritization because you may have a lot of goals, but how do you prioritize them? So when these numerous goals and numerous aspirations that you're carrying all the while with you um, and, and you're working very hard to achieve, do not all materialize uh, or some materialize and some don't. And in many cases, none materialize. Mm. Uh, because of the lack of prioritization, that leads to boredom, that leads to frustration, and that leads to cynicism where you say, look, the system is all useless and you know, my, my organization is at fault, my boss is you know, 
useless and so on. But I think it's a lack of prioritization of different goals because of which, and if you can't prioritize your goal, actually you can't achieve anything. It's, 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 it's that simple. And, and that is the, the primary per, reason for, for this a midlife crisis, boredom, mm. frustration, and so on. I mean, it's a very simple, you know, it's a, it's a very nice story that, uh, that made this thing clear to me many years ago. And this is a story about, not many people have read about it, but you can, you can check it out. It's a very interesting story of Warren Buffett. Uh, Warren Buffett owns many companies and he keeps buying small companies and he likes to mentor people who are working in those companies. So he was mentoring one of the senior executives, uh, somebody called Smith, and he said, Smith, um, you know, what are your goals? So Smith said, no, I, I work hard, uh, Warren, and, you know, we are doing a great job. Uh, that is my goal. He said, no, 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 no. What, what are your goals? So I want you to write down 10 goals that you have for yourself in your life. Now, that was a very big challenge for Smith, but he sat down uh, uh, you know, he cracked his head and finally put down 10 goals. Something like saying, I want to have $5 million in my bank account. I want to have a holiday home in the hills. I want to buy a, a fancy car. Um, and I want to send my children to Ivy League schools. Um, I want to have my own startup. I want to be a CEO. Um, and and he, he ran, then after that, you know, he, he wrote down, he says, I want to be... I want people to respect me and I want fame. I want to be physically fit and I want to have good relationships around me. So these were his 10 goals that he wrote down. So Warren said, okay, that these are great. Now, Smith, why don't you, uh, why don't you highlight three goals that you're going to work on? So that was even more difficult. He says, look, you know, I want to have $5 million. I want to become a CEO. I want to have my... Fancy car. He circled these three goals. So, I mean, Warren Buffett again asked him, saying, are you sure these are the most relevant goals in your life today? And mm. do you think that these goals can lead you to the other seven goals? Mm. Now, this was a very difficult question because, yeah, these are my big goals. I want to achieve this, but are these the most relevant or there is something else? Do these goals lead me to the other seven goals? He got very confused. So, Warren, of course, mentored him, said, look, boss, what are the things that will lead you to the other seven goals? Let's identify those three. Mm. And after a lot of help, uh, Smith then circled saying, yeah, actually, a good health is more important than <laughs> $5 million because if I'm not healthy and if I can't sleep well at night and I'm, my body is not physically fit, probably I'll die before I earn my $5 million. So he changed it, you know, mm. over there. Mm. And then he said, ah, uh, you know, having a good quality of relationships around me is more important than buying a holiday home in the hills. Quickly changed it. He realized, yeah, that's correct. Because if I have good quality of relationships, I will have a good balance of life. With my good balance of life, actually, I can, I can be stress-free, hmm. you know, achieve much more in life and so on. And like that, he realized that the three basic goals that he found out were becoming, you know, physically fit, having great relationships around me, and number three, uh, working to become respectful, mm -hmm. and 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 you know uh, somebody who is looked upon as an expert in the industry. Very good. So now Warren asked him, "Say this is fine. Now tell me, Smith, what will you do with the other seven goals?" Mm -hmm. So Smith was very quick in saying, "Look, these are three top goals, and these are the three goals I'll focus most of my time on, and the other seven I will work on them." but I'll give them less time. However, they will remain my secondary goals to work on. So Warren Buffett almost jumped from his chair and he says, this is where you're going wrong, my friend. When you've decided on your three goals, you need to eliminate the remaining seven. Mm. Otherwise, you will work on all the 10 goals which, are, which you are doing today and not achieving any. Mm. So prioritization actually means elimination of goals not just defining of goals. And many of us can't eliminate goals and therefore we keep our hands in 10 different directions and, and we don't achieve anything. And then we start not taking responsibility, blaming others, blaming the system, blaming the whole thing and getting bored, frustrated mm -hmm. and exactly what we just discussed. So I think that for me has been the biggest 
learning, and that is the biggest reason why people get frustrated, uh, you know, in their careers. So, so as you know, Deepak, I like to dig deep and bring out people's personal stories that they are, and bring out their authenticity, right? So, did you go through this midlife career crisis phase yourself, and how do you navigate that? Yeah, luckily, I I escaped it because I had many things helping me realize this. Uh, many things that happened around me, unfortunate events, which uh, probably were eye-opening and, and mm. sent me into the path of realization. Uh, very unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, in in um, much before I was, uh, you know, this turning probably happened at the age of 35. Also saw in Citibank around me, uh, young people uh, in their mid thirties, uh, late thirties, having heart problems. You know, mm. uh, that was, uh, you know, that was very revealing. And people were having heart attacks. They had uh, stents put. Uh, they had uh, angina issues. I mean, a lot of health issues. I also realized at some stage that I was myself not able to sleep well. I had some sort of, you know, tingling in my fun- finger pr- uh, tips and so on, which was like the initial uh, signs of becoming a nervous, uh, uh, mm. you know, uh, so getting into nervous problems, uh, you know, where you, if you don't check, uh, you can actually have health related issues or a nervous breakdown at some stage because of the tremendous amount of pressure. These things which I saw around me and which was happening to me actually helped me take a very quick decision of quitting Citibank when I was 35 years old, uh, 11 years into my job. Mm. And luckily at the same time, another new bank was being set up by uh, a boss of mine. He he lived in a completely different world, in an alternative space. You know, he was the most chilled out man, the most sorted out man. He had his priorities right. He could get things done without getting stressed. Uh, he was a great man. And so I got an opportunity to work with him, quit Citibank. That was when my second, my uh, younger daughter was was born. Mm. Uh, people said I was crazy leaving Citibank, especially when I was doing extremely well over there. Uh, but I had to do it. And and I've never looked back. And I think that was the best decision I took. Uh, and yes, so I went through it, but I was lucky I came out uh, on the right side of it. So, so we've talked so far uh, in, in this segment about reasons why many get dissatisfied with their careers and how you went to that, well, you avoided that phase and and cleverly sidestepped that. Uh, but my, my going back to my original question, Deepak, given your longevity in this industry, which is not that common, uh, especially given your level of engagements and motivation, what are the three things that have kept you going in the same industry for so long? I think one, the industry is very interesting. I just love the global markets. There is so much happening there. It's changing every minute, every hour. Mm. Uh, and and as I am deeply involved in it, it just keeps me new things, new challenges, new opportunities, uh, new solutions to work on uh, for our clients, um, new products to create, uh, and and learning. So you know, th- there is so much of learning in this. So the second important thing is upgrading my skills. So I think when you realize the enormity of this industry and this the space you work in, you realize that you know nothing even though you, you've been studying and practicing for so long. Mm. So that itself, that that uh, ability to constantly keep learning and upgrading myself probably has helped me. Uh, and that has kept me in pace with what was the requirement. But I think that comes from the realization that as you know more, you realize you, you know even lesser and lesser about the whole world. Uh, so, so, you know, 24 hours sometimes are less in terms of gathering all the information and a lifetime is less in terms of learning all the things you want to learn. So I think those are the things that have kept me going. And of course, with that, I have been able to keep growing my job uh, throughout. So, uh, you know, my job titles may not have changed very often, but I have been able to grow my job because no one can stop you from taking more responsibilities. So as I've taken more responsibilities, everyone has welcomed that. And as you take more responsibilities, you get in, get your hands into many growth areas. I've been a sort of a startup guy, even though I've been working in a salaried job, I've been 
launching new projects, uh, products, new businesses, new locations. So for the last two decades, probably I've been more of a startup guy uh, and a startup expert in, in the bank rather than uh, you know, starting up new ventures as a salaried man, but always reinventing stuff. Uh, so I think these are the sort of things, uh, you know, that have kept me going and I still feel very fresh. And I don't think I've, when I look back, I doesn't think, it doesn't appear that I've spent 30 years doing the job that I'm doing today. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting though. Well, more power to you um, and, and your response to that last question allows me to neatly segue from the personal side of Deepak Mehra to the professional work done by Deepak Mehra, right? Uh, you played a key role, Deepak, in launching Investor, the I-N-V-E-S-T-R, uh, Commercial Bank of Dubai's new robo-advisory investment app that went live, I believe, in April 2021. Now, I find this fascinating, Deepak, because CPT has a reputation as a super conservative, cautious, slow-moving bank that's definitely or was not known for innovation. It's almost like a mini case study for change management. Uh, so I've got, I've got three questions here. First one was, uh, what were the key leadership, not technical, uh, challenges in this project? I'm especially curious about innovation and cultural change within the organization? I, okay, thank you very much. I think you're, you're absolutely right. That has been one of the key achievements in, in, in the last two years that we've become the first um, bank in the GCC to launch a full-fledged robot advisory and an execution app, um, a standalone app. Mm. No bank has done it in the GCC still. Uh, I think the, the, the key learning here is that the culture of an organization is driven top down. Mm. Culture is not set, at the, set by the people at the bottom or in the middle. Uh, the culture is set at the top and then it trickles down. So what is then done by the leaders is then followed by others. So we were lucky we got a new CEO in 2017. Uh, he's a PhD in artificial intelligence and when he came on board, the first thing he did was he started digitizing every process, every mm. product, every process, every opportunity to digitize, to make it more efficient. And so robot advisory was part of that. Uh, so the wealth management business had to be digitized. And that was a mandate given to me. And, and we were able to achieve it because of the culture of innovation that was set in the organization from the top and which was trickling down. So that was the, the biggest help. Uh, else you would obviously have challenges if you are going to maneuver a big mm. ship, you know, suddenly 180 degrees, it doesn't work. So yeah, we were very lucky in doing that. I'm sure not everything went exactly according to plan, Deepak, in this uh, massive digitization project, right? That's just reality. So what were your key takeaways on the people side, post-implementation, looking back, that could have been handled or done better, probably? Um, I, you know, I think the success of this project, I would put it as a people's success. And I think you mm -hmm. rightly said it's the people's side. So the success is the people's success because technology is technology. Anyone could have implemented it. But why is it that we thought of it and why is it that we were able to implement in record time? I think it comes down to how you conduct a, a project and, and and uh, that is something that I've done many times in my career. And, and I, again, go back to the basic principle saying people know their jobs better than I do. Uh, a technology expert knows more about APIs and how they speak to each other than I would ever know. Um, so let people do their jobs. And all we can do uh, is keep them engaged, keep the team in uh, you know, as thinking as one. Uh, and have that level of uh, responsibility given to everyone, the level of authority given to everyone so that they can drive their businesses and agendas to get the project rolling. But you cannot move away from the, the, uh, you know, the accountability. The accountability still stays with the, 
with the person who's leading the project. Mm. So give responsibilities, give account, uh, give uh, authority, and let everyone do their jobs. Treat everyone like an adult. Uh, they know their job better. They all came to work, leaving their homes because they want to achieve something. So let them do their jobs. Give them a bigger sense of purpose so that they know what they're working towards. Engage with them with your heart. Connect with each one of them. Uh, and, and then yet stay fully accountable so that if something doesn't go, go the right way, you take the responsibility. <laughs> you don't dump and don't put one of the person under the bus saying, look, he messed up. So stay accountable, but give responsibilities. I think that's how we, we worked on this project. And, and those were the sort of learnings on the people side. You know. mm. This, of course, uh, Deepak brings me to the burning issue of technology, humans, and employment, right? Mm. I mean, I'm a CFA charter holder and member of CFA Institute and uh, read a lot about these things. And many in the asset management industry are worried that innovations like robot advisory are just the beginning, you know, the thin edge of the wedge. And automation in this huge multi-trillion dollar industry may result in reduced hirings or even mass layoffs uh, in, in the near to medium term. So I wanted your thoughts on a couple of things. Uh, first was, how do you see the impact of this automation as an example, robot advisory as an example, on jobs and asset management playing out over the next decade globally? Yeah, there, there will be an impact. The traditional jobs of a, of a fund manager and the traditional job of a relationship manager uh, where the value addition is very low is likely to be at risk. But then there'll be jobs created on the other side. The jobs, jobs will be created on, on data analytics, on, on, uh, on uh, managing technology, on running algorithms, on programming the algorithms, mm. uh, on, on running the artificial intelligence uh, coding and so on. So higher value added jobs will come up. But as far as asset management industry is concerned, I think it's very clear. You look at the S&P SPIVA report, which comes out every year, tells you the variance in performance of the active fund manager uh, managers, and it shows year on year that uh, th this year's report shows that 95% of active managers in the large cap space could not have, could not even achieve the index performance. But, and if you look at across all industries, all sectors, 85% of the managers across all actively managed funds could not achieve their benchmark performance. Mm. So I think the case for passive index investing is very strong. Now, what robo advisory does is it puts a twist to that that yes index investing is great but then within indices how do you do the asset allocation mm. and that's where robo advisory comes in which is completely algorithm driven there is no artificial intelligence yet it's all algorithms that are taking those decisions and and yes when, once you do all this you actually get a better risk uh, weighted performance than an actively fund actively managed fund manager who charges two percent or one and a half percent per annum and yet, 85% of them miss even achieving the index return. So, so yes, traditional asset management jobs will be at risk. More and more money will flow into these uh, products. But then, as I said, there will be opportunities created on the other side. Like, likewise, on the relationship front-end side, uh, banks are very keen to move uh, you know, the, the middle market and the lower end of the wealth management market, the mass affluent as we speak, affluent and mass affluent into into digital uh, solutions where the front end can be hyper personalized thanks to technology mm. but the back end gets industrialized and human intervention or human interface will only be available for high end private banking clients where it is worth it where the value addition is there in terms of providing better service not necessarily again beating the benchmark or mm. driving performance but in providing the service to the customers who, who need it but Banks will not be able to provide it for retail customers or for affluent or mass affluent customers. So that will go more into private banking. The rest will get uh, digitized. Mm. So, so yes, there will be an impact. It's coming. And it's happening. And my second question in the context of automation in asset management, Deepak, was what can senior professionals, you know, people with 15, 20 years experience, do to stay relevant in the face of this massive changes. 
and not turn into dinosaurs in this new age of big data and AI and accompanying disruption? I, I think it's very, very, very easy to become a dinosaur in this industry because it is changing so rapidly. Mm. Uh, and, and many, many people will be left behind. I think the most important thing, and we go back to this again and again, is self-awareness. Understand where you are, understand your skills, understand where you lack skills, but you can't do all this if you still live with a big mm. ego and you think you know it all and you think you've done it all. Uh, and because you're sitting on your laurels, you, you should continuously be appreciated and, and you should continuously grow. None of, none of that will happen. Uh, in fact, anyone who thinks that he knows it all will become a dinosaur for sure. Mm. Uh, that is the first sign. Knowing it all is the first sign of ignorance. Uh, and I think uh, this is a wake up call for everyone. I think we have to immerse ourselves into new technology, roll up our sleeves, get back into upgrading our skills. You have to constantly learn, ask a good doctor, whether he's 40 years old or 50 or 60 or 70 years old, like I saw in case of my grandfather, mm. he used to attend seminars, conferences, read journals. There was no internet in those days, make notes. A doctor has to continuously learn, otherwise he'll become irrelevant. So why shouldn't bankers and why shouldn't other professionals do that? Why can't they continuously learn? And learning doesn't mean taking another degree or, or mm. diploma or a certificate. Learning means learning. Get to know the subject, immerse yourself into it and drop your ego to begin with. You're also a published author, Deepak, and your book, Ready, Steady, Go, came out in 2015, I believe. And yes. there was a concise and practical guide on, among other things, uh, education, upskilling, uh, and careers. It's been seven years and the world has changed a lot since then, not the least because of COVID and related changes to the workplace. All this must have made you uh, think about growing, the growing secular trends and issues and opportunities in the workplace, right? So what's the next book on? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, there is, a, there is another book coming. Um, and and that is uh, that is called um, you know it's called think like a golfer mm -hmm. uh, and you know in many ways it captures all the evolution of thinking that has happened in my own mind over the last seven years uh, and I've been able to you know get inspiration from the game of golf mm -hmm. so and golf has you know golf is such a unique game because it's it's, it's so different from other games here. Uh, even though you are competing with others, but no one else has any impact on your performance. You play with your own ball, which you mm. carry all the way over the 18, core, uh, 18 holes, um, over a huge length, maybe three, four kilometers of, of course. Uh, and everyone plays with their own ball. Everyone has their own set of equipment, a wide range of equipment, a wide range of terrain, nothing is set, everything is uncertain. So it's the most closest to your day-to-day -day life that you live. Mm. So in a way, it is a metaphor for life, not just professional life, but life in general. And, and, drive, and deriving those learnings from golf, um, you know, I've, I've written this book and it is to develop a mindset of a golfer mm. uh, uh, and, and win like a golfer does. Uh, with 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 grace and dignity and 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 you know high standards, so so that's what my new book is. In fact, it has seven different lessons that come out of golf and 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 they start with clarity, you know, clarity of purpose and goal and planning, because mm -hmm. you can't win the game of golf without planning the eighteen courses in advance. Actually, winners are decided way before the game starts, and that's exactly in life as well. The courage, courage to change, to adapt to different circumstances, uh, becoming flexible, um, detachment, uh, golf, you're playing with a tiny little ball over massive, uh, you know, terrain where every shot that you take, you have very little, uh, you know, control over the outcome, except you have control over how you play the shot, your own technique. And there is no copybook style of shots in golf. Every, every place uh, requires a different sort of a shot. So detachment of, of the ability to observe yourself and, and play the shots without stress. 
the excellence where you not you don't compete with anyone else but you're competing with your own self you have a handicap that you're trying to beat uh execution you know the big shots the 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 drive drive shots and the the putting shots which are calibrated more calibrated uh you know so act big big and act small so you should be good at execution of big and small things and and uh, um, other aspects like integrity and high moral standards uh, you know golf is a game which does not have uh, referees running around you checking where you where you hit the ball from and how are you going to hit your next shot actually there is a game referee there are a few game referees but no one is watching you every time you're scoring your own self in most of the play times this is a very different game from from others like football or cricket where there are cameras and mm-hmm. and other people watching you and then calling out if you if you're trying to cheat here no one calls you out if you cheat you cheat no one checks it so it's a game of very high moral standards and then finally golf is a game which is played even though it's a very tough game physically demanding but it's played at a very slow pace it takes 4 or 5 hours to finish a game of golf so take it easy in life you know have a balance so those are the sort of things that are coming out uh, which are becoming um, uh, become more important today the, the aspects of managing ourselves today are more important in this highly uh, you know volatile and changing uh, environment that we are getting into uh, so i think that that's that is what i've tried to bring into this book so deepak at this stage i usually ask my guests for their top 3 career tips right but i suspect that will be a glaring injustice in your case as you have seen a lot of life and work and hence wise up more than many so i think three tips might be uh, not doing justice while well, broaden the scope and i will ask you what are your top 5 tips on career and life specifically deepak for senior executives okay a very good question uh, binod i think one of the key things that we need to understand as senior executives is that that the corporate world whether you are an employee or you are an entrepreneur you are running your own business or you are working for a large business the whole corporate setup the structure is pitched against you mm. from developing uh the corporate structure survives on status quo on achieving commercial success day in day out every day every week every month every quarter so the corporate structure needs efficient managers managers who can utilize their resources very well to deliver results mm. if someone evolves into a leader it is by their own self awareness the corporate structure depends upon a hierarchy where people are given put in different levels to manage their resources at their level they are all managers by definition uh and therefore it is as i said pitched against your interests of development mm. now we know that the corporate structure looks like a pyramid so as you go up the space becomes thinner and thinner and the air becomes rarer and rarer with height so so just doing your job well and performing and di- achievement of results will make you a great manager that can never make you a great leader so becoming a great leader and therefore being able to sustain the rarefied air at the top and getting invited at the top is something that the organizations don't develop even though they conduct many leadership courses you and i have been on many none of them teach you any of the stuff that we are talking uh except yours we know i know you you have you recently conducted a brilliant leadership course for a bank correct uh, in the ifc and those are the sort of courses we need as i opener so i congratulate you and i congratulate the organization that called you because these are out of the ordinary sort of developments the the run of the mill de- development courses and leadership development courses don't take you there true so for me uh, there are five different mindsets uh, and you said five points so i'm picking mm-hmm. up five points that people have to define for themselves And, and develop their leadership skills so the first one is to upgrade their skills upgrade the skills does not mean technical skills alone we spoke about that that's very important that 
technical skill upgradation is an ongoing job, otherwise you become a dinosaur. But I'm talking more about life skills, about uh, relationship skills, about uh, soft skills, uh, about people skills, uh, communication skills, mm -hmm. and so on. People have to invest in development of their skills just because they are at a certain stage of hierarchy in the organization can give, lead to a sense of delusion, a delusion that they have achieved it all and they know it all. I think that's where they need to step back, drop their ego and start upgrading their skills. And I said, these are the sort of skills that we need to work on and w which are very difficult to begin with, you know, mm. a good communication skills, good skill to write, a, you know, a great note, a great email, write concisely, precisely, speak in, 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 in a good, uh, uh, you know, elegant manner. Things like these have to be learned. We are not all born with those skills, but these are very important for leadership. Mm. Uh, the ability to communicate with others, the ability to, uh, to, con to connect with others, uh, the, the, the soft skills that go with leadership skills, the relationship skills. So, so there is no end to it. So upgrade, upgrade, and upgrade. That's mantra number one. Mm. The second one is, even though it's very important to work with your head, it is equally important to work with your heart. So creating that engagement with others, like I said, not just uh, a one-way communication, but a two-way two communication, allowing people to, to flourish, uh, uh, inviting ideas from others, engaging others in decision-making, and carrying the whole team together uh, and understanding that each one is a unique person are, are the, the, the heart, uh, managing with your heart skills. So these are, this is my point number two. The third point I would say is integrity and moral compass. You know, mm -hmm. how, do I, how do I guide myself? Uh, uh, are, the, are the end results and outcomes more important or are the means equally important. So having that moral compass always with you, which says that the means are as important, if not more important than the ends. Uh, and, 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 you know, because it's very easy to become successful. If you're competent, technically, you can become successful. But there is a whole lot of difference between becoming successful and staying successful. Mm. That staying successful bit comes with character. So it's competence and character. When you combine the two, you, you sustain your success. Otherwise, it can come, competence can take you uh, and give you flashes of success. And then it leads to the same thing that we've spoken about, the frustration, hitting a dead end, hitting a ceiling. And then people don't know why they've got stuck, whereas they probably haven't upgraded themselves, they haven't used their heart, and they are focusing on the outcome and not on the means, and therefore they're getting stuck. So moral com compass is very important. Now you can't achieve any of this if, you, if you're not living a balanced life. Now, balanced life does not mean that leaving office on time and, and, and not working over the weekends and staying away from, yeah, that's all very important, that is good. But then what do you do over your weekend? And what do you do in your off time? You can't balance work with emptiness. So if it is a scale and I put something here on one side, which is work, which is heavy, I can't put nothing on the other side and say my scale is balanced. It will not be balanced. I'll have to put something. Now that something are those little small goals and my, my little achievements uh, on my personal development side, which I do for my weekend, which then help me balance the scale. Small, there is nothing that gives you more happiness than defining small goals and achieving them on a regular basis. So that is what you should be doing in your free time and not mindless socializing, partying, drinking, or, or binge watching television and so on. Now, socializing is very important, but to an extent, uh, how will you upgrade yourself? How will you learn? When will you read the books you need to read? When will you listen to the podcasts and, and YouTube videos that you want to learn to to, to expand your thinking, your horizons, your perspective. If you are constantly busy in socializing, partying, and drinking, and numbing your and numbing your 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 faculties uh, uh, by indulging in in stuff which really is not uplifting, but but it actually pulls you down. So 
So this is this is the balance that I'm referring to. And finally, fifth <clears throat> and the most important one, which we which has been the theme of this discussion, is self awareness and becoming an observer and not getting caught in your own thinking. You know, constantly thinking uh, itself is is a and and listening to the voice in your head, which keeps pushing you either in the future, the anxiety of what's going to come in the future, or pushing you in the in the past, saying regrets uh, of the past, saying I could have done that, and why did he say this, and why did he do that, and why did he send this email? Mm. What should I do about it? And then worrying about the future. The, the mind is like a monkey that is never still, so it keeps pushing you either in the future or in the past. This is a disease. That voice in the head is a disease that keeps that does not allow you to stay in the present, and because you are not in the present, you are not able to be aware. Uh, and therefore, I think developing self awareness is the beginning and the most important part on which everything else is built on. So, just to summarize the five points: upgrade your skills, use your heart more, have a very strong moral compass, balance your life, and become a self. aware and observer that's a very beautifully encapsulated and uh, wrap up of this very interesting interview uh, by sheer coincidence uh, just today on linkedin i posted about self awareness and the top 12 tips to develop self awareness based on a request from someone on linkedin and i posted that almost every conversation that i have with people uh, especially senior leaders especially uh, including my coaching clients comes back to self awareness and like you said that has been the con- uh, recurring theme and rightly so in this podcast interview and becoming an observer rather than just being a mere player can transform your thinking and your career and your life and that is a very important takeaway i could go on and on about the insights and 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 the nuggets of wisdom and the quotable quotes from this podcast which i'll probably keep on posting for the next few months deepak uh, so you you're definitely going to be in the limelight for some time thank you so much for making time from your hectic schedule i know you have a lot of priorities going on right now i appreciate the time you've taken to prepare for this podcast meticulously uh, as is your uh, style and to share your thoughts uh, and i hope people take the time out to listen and introspect and apply this as far as possible in their careers and their personal lives and i'm sure they will see the change not overnight but over time so thank you once again deepak thank you very much you know it's such a pleasure talking to you again as it is always thank uh, you thank you because it's brought to you by the real finance mentor thank you so much for listening and i really hope you found it insightful and inspirational if you did enjoy this episode please drop us a review and spread the word and be sure to check out more exclusive content on the realfinancementor.com and my linkedin profile which is binod shankar cfa let's keep in touch just add your name to the mailing list on the realfinancementor.com and we'll tell you about new episodes plus book reviews upcoming events and blogs till the next time onwards and upwards